Thank you. I am so excited about this event. Um, I have been waiting for this and last week I actually confirmed why I was waiting for it. Um, but I just like to get started and introduce our guest which is Marita Golden. She is an American novelist, nonfiction writer, professor, and co-founder of the Hurston Wright Foundation, a national organization that serves as a resource center for African-American writers. And for today, she is the author of The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. So I know that you are going to begin with talking about the book, and then I'll have um, some time to ask you questions. So Marita, I'm just gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. I am enormously pleased and gratified to be here with all of you today. And um, this is a book, this is kind of the little book that could. Um, this is a book that has really struck a nerve with a lot of people. I've been deeply gratified by the response to it. And it's a book that was my pandemic project. I know that for many of us, as we were on lockdown, probably from March, 2020 to the end of 2020, many of us found ourselves um, engaged in projects that we never thought we'd be engaged in. Yes, we were challenged by new things, but for a lot of us, it, was, it has been a time of growth and renewal. And this is a book that like most of my books, I had not planned to write, but this is a book that like all of my books chose me. And I got my assignment from God, I reported for duty, and I wrote this book. This is a book that is a book of stories, a book of voices. I'm not a therapist, I'm not a doctor. I'm a black woman who grew up influenced by and deeply affected by the strong black woman complex. And I started writing this book at a time when it was clear that this is a belief system and ideology that is being interrogated, that is being questioned and that quite frankly is being redesigned. So when I found all the things that were going on, I enlisted into this army of writers and scholars and journalists and, and, and women of all ages who were saying, you know, I think I wanna sit down. You know what? I think I'm ready to ask for help. And this is something entirely new in the African-American culture, the African-American female culture. So first, what do we mean by the strong black woman complex? Those of you African-American women in the audience, you know instinctively, you know in your blood what it is. You know, because you've heard your mother say, stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. You heard your mother or your father say, you're gonna to have to be twice as good, three times as good to get anywhere in this society. And um, those are statements that both inspire us but they also burden us so that we have a long tradition of feeling that we had to be invincible, that we are invincible. And it was an adaptation that grows out of the period of our enslavement where the horrors, the horrors, the horrors of our enslavement required us to keep moving, to keep moving, to be invincible, to be super strong. And I wanna say for a minute, even though we're interrogating that complex, our grandmothers and our mothers did the best they could. They were strong because that's what they were told to be and that's what they knew to tell us to be. But we're new women. We are women who, were, uh, who have grown up in the wake of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, Oprah Winfrey, and all of the ways in which the culture is now making a space to discuss the taboo to discuss the painful. And so one of the dark sides of the strong black woman complex, which on the one hand empowers us enormously, the dark side of course, is that it puts us on emotional lockdown because if we have to be strong all the time, we can't be human. It centers the expression of normal feelings like fear, doubt, uncertainty, and especially the ability to ask for help. Secondly, we find that right now at this moment, African-American women are in a health emergency. We are the fastest growing group of women who are developing dementias. We have off the charts rates of diabetes and obesity related illnesses like stroke and heart attack are rampant in our society, in our black society as a 
as an echo of the larger society. And these are things that if we're going to be strong all the time, we cannot talk about. There remains a stigma in our community around mental health. I was talking to a woman recently who said that uh, she has a very deeply church going family. And when they found out that she had sought the help of a mental care, mental health professional, the family was aghast and they prayed over her. They called a family meeting to pray over her and to inquire why prayer and why Jesus was not simply enough. Our relationships with other people are corrupted in our family when we're always the, the fix it person, the ATM, the therapist, the healer for everyone else but ourselves, we are deeply diminishing ourselves and we don't take care of ourselves nearly in the way that we can and should. And during the question and answer period, I will talk more about the impact of this on our physical and mental health. And then of course, there's systemic racism. And over the past couple of years, as I've researched a number of books and articles that I've been writing, it's clearly known, clearly stated, clearly acknowledged that systemic racism in all its forms, macro and micro, is a stress factor in the bodies and in the minds of Black people. It's a stress factor that makes it harder for us to maintain good health. It makes it harder for us to heal when we are sick. And so unless we have integrated into our lives practices, mental and physical practices that honor mental and physical well-being, I really feel that we're conspiring with systemic racism. We are dying in America because we're Black and we really do not have to. There are many things that we can do. So to move to the book, as I said, this is a book that is a book of stories. It's a book of voices. And as I was doing my research, I, I came across all these very difficult statistics about the lives of Black women that we're twice as likely to do this, twice as likely to do that, and all of it negative. But I didn't want it to be a book only about challenging statistics. I wanted it to be an inspiring book. I wanted it to be a book that in the final analysis would uplift Black women. And I've been very pleased that the response to the book has affirmed that that's what the book does. So this is a book that's written kind of in what I call a communal memoir format. It's a format I use with my book, Saving Our Sons, my book, Don't Play in the Sun. And I start with my story and then I weave in like a quilt, the voices of experts, um, doctors, and especially black women telling me their stories. So I'm gonna read three different little sections from the book. The first is where I talk about my experience as a strong black woman at a pivotal point in my life when my mother was deeply ill and in fact was dying. Um, and then I'm going to read a section from um, a part in the book where I have asked Black women to talk about trauma, to talk about healing, and specifically to talk about going into therapy and how therapy healed them and changed their lives. Uh, one of the most satisfying sections of the book for me to write was a section called Reimagining the History of My Heart. As I was writing, I got to thinking, you know, how we have created our heroes, our sheroes, women like uh, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Fanny Lehmer. And I thought about how we had never really heard their voices talking about vulnerability or pain and how important it is to make a space in public discourse and in our imagination of them, of them as fully dimensional women who struggled and yes, who, who did things for the race, but who had private issues of their own. And we have to embrace all of that, all that they were. So I'm going to read these three sections um, and then we can have our conversation. Um, I was 21 years old and my mother was dying. I was a B plus student at American University and I'd already started wearing the mask, the strong black woman mask. As a strong black woman, that meant quote, you did what you had to do 
no matter what. My mother was dying, but I had to continue to be a successful student. Being a strong black woman meant you didn't bother others unnecessarily with your pain. In the small apartment where I lived with my mother, my nights were sleepless, tear-filled meltdowns in which in the dark I whispered, shouted, and screamed the questions I was terrified to ask in the light of day. Why would I soon be a motherless child? How would I go on? I'd rarely, if ever, seen my mother cry. Maybe she too cried in the dark. How I wish she cried in the light. Despite all that she'd made of her life upon her arrival in the Washington DC, as part of the great migration of African Americans from the South, there was a lot she could have cried about. And what I'm writing about there is that when my mother was in a coma, having had a stroke, she was in a coma for six months and then she did die. Um, there was no one on that campus that knew my mother was dying. There was one friend who I told, but it was important to me as a young 21 year old strong black woman that nobody knew, that nobody had an inkling of my pain because I felt that would allow me to continue to be successful. Back then there was no concept of uh, vulnerability equaling strength. So as I said, I privileged talking to black women about their pain because I hadn't seen much of that in many of the books I read. And I sought out women and the first question I would ask is, well, you know, who made you a strong black woman? How did you learn to be a strong black woman? And the women that I talked to were deeply, deeply generous because they knew that telling their stories to me, they, they were gonna go in a book and they knew inherently that their stories would inspire others and that their stories had the power, in fact, to heal other black women. So I just wanna just publicly say how, how grateful I am to them for sharing me with their very precious stories stories that uh, we need to talk to about out loud. I'm going to read a section from one of the, I call them testimonies, um, a young woman who um, graduated from Howard University and she was kind of looking back on her years as a student. And one of the interesting things about our conversation is that for many people, there's this dichotomy between mental health care and religious faith. But for this young woman, that there, there was no dividing line. And I think that we're moving into a place where more and more, more of us are seeing that deep religious faith, spiritual faith is not inconsistent at all with seeking mental health. So this is Jamie, and I'm going to read um, a little bit of her story. She says, no doubt we were jacked up. Her father was an alcoholic. Her mother suffered from kidney disease and there was considerable emotional abuse in the family. But our church was where we all came together no matter what. I remember when I was 10 years old one Sunday, I went to the sanctuary and a woman prayed over me. She affirmed my purpose and what God had in store for me. I'll never forget that. The memory of that woman's hands kept pushing me through everything that the family, that and the family prayer line that my mother's side of the family set up and that I'm still a part of. My own faith, my mother's faith, all of that got me through everything. And everything included while in college, being the family breadwinner, using her scholarship money to buy food and pay household bills. Everything included watching her parents' 36 year marriage end, but because endings are rarely neat, seeing bitterness and distance and quarrels still erupt. She says, because by then I was deeply into the strong black woman, the superwoman contracts. All of this was my burden to carry. But at 19, Jamie took the first of many steps to lay her burden down by going to counseling for adult children of alcoholics. She says, prayer led me to counseling. All my life I've been told not to share our business, but prayer helped me realize it was okay to seek professional counseling outside the church. 
she had found faith to endure and overcome in church. But in group counseling, she could hear and see through the din and the fog of her life at home. She began to put together the pieces like a puzzle. Her father had told her, stand up for yourself. Don't let white people keep you down. But that warning was followed by the accusation that she talked too much and had a smart mouth. Her mother said, be proud, be a proud black woman, be strong, I love you, but don't tell anybody our business. Tell me what you feel, but I need you. You can handle this. You are the first one I call. I can always depend on you. Jamie was crumbling beneath this burden, but in group therapy, that was one place where she could be herself something she was still discovering. And she had the first honest conversation with her parents. She says, I told them, I can't carry you. I can't carry my anger. I can't carry my hurt. She said boundaries and put herself first. I wasn't protected as a child, but now I was ready to protect myself. I told them, I love you, mom. I love you, dad, but I release you. I choose me. And that's, that is a young lady who you know, all of us in this, on this Zoom know that young lady. She may be us. She may be our sister, our daughter, a friend. And as I said, she found a way to pray her way into counseling, which I think is so powerfully beautiful. And I just wanna say for a minute, this admonition in the black community to not share our business is deeply rooted in the ways in which the bureaucracies of government, local government, state government and various agencies have taken the quote business of black people's lives and use that information to derail their lives. And so when black people say, I don't want you to share our business, there are valid reasons, but we now know that we can move beyond that admonition and when it will help us emotionally and physically in the right spaces and with the right people, we can share our business. So when I wrote the chapter um, reimagining the history of my heart, as I said, I channeled Fannie Lou Hamer, Harriet Tubman, um, Rosa Parks, and I had a quote from um, Patrice Colors, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. And it's so interesting about Rosa Parks because she was a practitioner of, she, she meditated, she practiced Buddhism, and she did yoga. And she had a very definite specific way of maintaining her physical and her mental health. And she's a brilliant example of many ways that black women have done that. So this is me channeling Rosa Parks. For all that, I was never scared of white people. When a white boy pushed me when I was a little girl, I pushed him right back. My grandmother told me if I wasn't careful, I'd get lynched. And I told her, let them lynch me. You can look at me and see the African and the white and the Native American in me. There's been things written that of all the women who refused to give up their seat on a segregated bus to a white person, I was most well known because I'm light skinned. And because of that, the white public in the North would feel more sympathy for our cause. I was still a Negro and light skin didn't keep me from having to obey the laws of segregation until I decided not to. Light skin didn't keep me from getting fired from my job as a seamstress at the Montgomery Fair department store. And light skin didn't shield me from the pain of my coworkers refusing to talk to me after the boycott, calling me a troublemaker. Light skin didn't stop the hateful, threatening phone calls and the hate mail that started right after my arrest and followed me wherever I lived for the rest of my life. And I lived a long time. My husband Raymond lost his job too. 
And because of the stress of the backlash against us and the isolation, we felt like we were in the wilderness. Seemed like Negroes were more scared of us than white people. None of the civil rights groups that we had worked for offered help. We knew we'd have to pay a price. We'd been paying it all our lives. But this price, this price was heavy. And for a while would keep getting heavier. Eventually we moved to Detroit where I had family. Raymond had to get a license and train it all over again to be a barber. And I got piecemeal work as a seamstress. I'd always prided myself on my grace under pressure, being made of steel and soldiering on. But all that stress and disappointment caught up with me when I developed an ulcer and a throat tumor. I lived in two rooms with my mother and husband. We were in debt because of the medical bills. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for everybody to know how much it costs to be a hero, even when you're willing to be one. Jet Magazine did an article that let the public know how we were living and the NAACP paid the hospital bill. By 1961, six years after the boycott, our financial situation was better. I never let being poor stop me from, fight, from, fight, from activism. I joined neighborhood groups to get out the vote and to improve the schools. Then in 1965, Congressman John Conyers hired me as an assistant to work in his office. Conyers was a great man. He and I got along well because he was a rebel like me. Then in a two year period, I lost my husband, my mother and my brother. All of them died of cancer. And you can't tell me that our struggles fighting oppression and segregation, struggling for respect and quality didn't have something to do with them all dying like that. And when I died, the city buses in Montgomery and Detroit reserved their front seats with black ribbon. For two days, I lay in honor in the rotunda of the US Capitol. I was honored, but I was honored even more by what some people had said about me back in Montgomery when I was working with the NAACP. Oh, Miss Parks, she was a lady who held my hand when my uncle got beat up. She got my kid involved in a youth program. She was the one who came and tried to get me to register to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so powerful, um, everything that you read. And I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions and then open it up to the audience. And just for the audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll be able to call according to that um, and allow you to use your voice to ask the question. But first, I just like to start with, you know, the signals that were given as black women to be strong. And one of the things that stood out for me last week with Kentanji Brown is when she talked about her first year at Harvard, walking across the yard, she was feeling as if she couldn't make it. And a woman whispered to her, persist. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that we're telling each other. So how do we get over that when, you know, it's something that is hardwired for us to say to each other um, and that we take on as individuals when we are one of the only? Well, I think that she also said that hearing this woman who was involved in like a lower status job on the campus tell her to persist was also an inspiration. I remember when I was a student at American University and I would take the bus from my neighborhood up to American University, which was like entering a different world, a largely white community. And um, there were black women on the bus with me who were going to that same neighborhood to be domestic workers. And they knew that I was going to American University to study. And they never said anything to me, but I could see the pride in their eyes. And if I was to interpret that pride, it would be, you go on, you do it. I couldn't do it, but you do it for you and you do it for me and you do it for all of us. And so that perseverance trope is, is very important. But I think that as we have entered into white spaces, the white working world. See, our parents did a great thing. 
They said, get all the education you can. They psychologically made us strong so that when the doors would open, we were ready to go through them. But we had no idea. We had no idea of the psychological um, warfare that we would encounter. How could we? We'd never been in those spaces before. So I think that one of the things I often tell people about working in these spaces, it's really important to have support systems. Um, every time I've worked in, well, actually anywhere, but especially um, predominantly white institutions, I have had a sister circle. I have found black women. I don't care what department they worked in, we got together once a month so that we could be black, so that we could be black women, so that we could vent about the macro and micro racism, so that we could strategize ways to get around that and still feel that there was a place for us in those institutions. So that every institution that I've been working in where I have felt marginalized, I have created, if at all possible, a sister circle for my mental health and support. And then also it's important for us to do the work individually to maintain our mental health, you know, relaxation, um, taking care of our bodies. And one of the things that a sister circle can do is be your accountability circle so that you're all engaged together in that development of those practices. And I think I just want to say that I think this is a very important conversation for young Black women to have. Um, I know that on this call, there may not be many students, but I do urge you after this conversation to please engage the young Black women at MIT in this conversation. Many of them are the first generation in their families, even if they're the second generation, and they're going to be the anchors. They're going to be the ones that the family brags about, the family is proud of. They're also going to be the one that the family looks to to solve their problems. And they're going to have to learn early now, now, how to lovingly set boundaries and have conversations with their family about their mental health, maintaining it, and their family maintaining their mental health. I appreciate you saying that because we do have a program here at MIT, My Sister's Keeper, um, to bring uh, young Black women together. And there are administrators and faculty who support the program. Um, one of the things I was thinking about when you were mentioning that is a lot of times, even when they are setting boundaries, they are still in isolation um, because of they are the one. Um, and then there's this ex expectation for them to be strong and for them to produce. And it's not just within the Black community. I'm finding that there's this image of the strong Black women that is projected from everyone. So I just wondered about your thoughts on that. Well, I think that you're, you're absolutely right. And we have to realize that this is, isn't something that is achieved over the weekend. We're talking about a lifestyle, a life journey, a life adventure, a life endeavor so that it's got many, many components from recognizing that you have, first, that you have the right to say yes to yourself. Very often when we think we're saying no to someone, we're actually saying yes to ourselves. Are you ready to say yes to yourself? Do you think you deserve a yes? Can you say yes and really feel you deserve it? That I think for me is the number one question. Forget the no and the pushback that you will get to that no, but do you really believe that you deserve a yes? A lot of times we don't wanna say yes because uh, say for example, I say, well, my sister asked me for the third time when you babysit my kids and I really don't want to. I can't say yes because well, if I say yes and I don't babysit her kids, then what am I going to do? Well. I'm not used to spending any time by myself. I'm not used to doing anything with myself that would bring me joy. Anytime I'm by myself and not working like a dog for the family, all my fear, all my demons, all my insecurities come up. So that's one reason I keep saying yes to other people and no to me is so I don't have to think about who I am. 
And that's where you seek out mental health support, counseling services. So it really is about you. It's not about the pushback. It's not about the relatives who keep asking you to do this and they're getting on your nerves. It's about your ability to say, yes, that's really where it starts. And it will take time because no one ever told you that you had the right to say yes. So it's going to be a journey that you embark on and it's exciting, it's scary. And also a lot of times around us, we are surrounded by women who are doing what we want to do. We're surrounded by women who are what we want to be. And once we sharpen our vision and our understanding of ourselves, we can see those women and we can talk to them about their journey. Thank you for that. Uh, another question I had regarding, you know, seeing these women in spaces and places that we haven't thought of and looking up to them. Do you find when it comes to this strong black woman trope that there's this expectation that you are to take on and mentor everyone who comes to you? Um, and if so- I tell them I'm not human resources. <laughs> I hope everybody on this call hears that. <laughs> I tell them I'm not human resources. You know, I, I write in the book about teaching at a historically white university and on the one hand being marginalized and mammified at the same time. So that, you know, um, white students would come to me and ask me to go to my fellow white male colleagues um, to talk about things that, about them, that they did not want to talk to that professor about. And the response, what I would get is, well, you know, one day I'm going to be a writer. And um, if, he, if I make this person angry by complaining about something, he could ruin his career. Now this student hadn't, hadn't published a darn thing. Okay, yeah. But already they imagine themselves as a bestseller. And so my job and instinctively, and sometimes black students will do the same. Black students, we get mammified by students, period. And we have to decide, okay, I mean, I would decide, okay, is this a legitimate thing where I want to extend myself? Or am I being asked to be human resources? And I think it's really important to simply say, that's out of my purview. Um, I'm not human resources. And there will be times, however, when you will want to extend yourself. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But if people are coming to you, as often happens with Black faculty and Black administrators, as, you, as if you are human resources and therapy at the same time, you do have to set boundaries. Thank you for that. We were just talking about that earlier this morning. I met with a group who, um, are a support system for me. And it was talking about black faculty, you know, always being the one to support. And when it comes to service, you're missing out on your service as you're going towards your tenure process. Exactly. And, and so you're getting it from white students who want you to solve, fix something and black students, give me a hug. Okay, so the black students need to have a hug group. Okay, they need to have their own hug group because you can't hug everybody. <laughs> I'm going to say that too. <laughs> so I want to open it up for the audience. Um, and please raise your hand. I think that would be helpful. And then I'll let you speak. So I'll be able to see your hand if you raise your virtual hand. Questions from anyone? Okay, I see Andrea Kelton Harris. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much, Tracy, for and everyone at MIT for this wonderful partnership with Harvard, um, with the Harvard Association of Black Faculty Administrators and Fellows. Um, Ms. Golden, your presentation in your book is amazing. It, it resonates in so many ways with me. Um, one area where it resonates is trying to find that balance between church and therapy um, and having it always viewed as being either a religious issue or a secular issue. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how one might try to find that kind of balance? 
Well, it's very interesting because I just read an article that the new president of the American Psychological Association is an African-American woman who's a minister <laughs> and who in her church talks about um, the role of mental health care. Um, and I think that, as I said earlier, the newer, the younger generation of Black people who are who are in church, involved in church on a regular basis as an expression of their, their religious faith are beginning to chip away at that. And I think sometimes institutions have to be changed from the outside. That is the, the, the people who are in, in the institution are very inured to the way it works. And sometimes they need outsiders to come in to inspire a conversation. But I think, for example, if this is something that in your religious institution you feel is lacking, I would have a conversation with the minister about my concern that as a community, we're in a mental health crisis and we, be, we need to be led to mental health services and that there is no contradiction. We can be people full of faith and we can see these services as an expression of the world that God has made. So I think that if I was a member of a congregation and there seemed to be um, a resistance as a, as a member of that church, I would feel invested in opening and starting that conversation. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. You know, my husband is the pastor and he's, <laughs> you know, the, the relationship and connection between both of those worlds. But sometimes right. the members are so rooted in what they were taught. Um, and so this is very helpful. Um, and thank you so much. And I love that, that thought of sometimes change from the outside. Um, and what I'll do, uh, Tracy, I will send you the article about this, you know, I can't think of her name now who is the director of the American Psychological Association and she's a minister. Um, please it's reach out to me. Bryant. Right. And, and the article was in the Washington Post. Exactly. Yeah, it's a great article and um, how she's combining both. And I think the resistance is normal. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't be surprised at resistance. People are comfortable. Yeah. And you're trying to introduce something to them that's new, that's gonna make them have to, think about their lives and their choice and their values. So the resistance is known, but the resistance can, can, be, can be overcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Next question, please raise your hand if you have a question. Alex Galindo. Hi, uh, good afternoon, thank you. Um, I work at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and um, I work with uh, student diversity initiatives. And so I guess my question is what advice could you give me as a Latinx male to become, as you mentioned, the right people for uh, black women to feel at, this, at the school students, to feel comfortable to come uh, to me so that I can provide with the, the, like the best support that I can, uh, because unfortunately uh, I'm never gonna be no Tracy Jones. So, <laughs> so but, I, but I, I do care and I do want uh, students to feel comfortable talking to me. And obviously I would never dream of even coming close to understanding the plight of the black woman in, in the United States, but, but I do want to be a resource and, and, and be helpful. Uh, how can I present myself? What, what, what can I do to like, uh, not, not necessarily that they open up their business to me, but at least that they feel comfortable coming to me with questions and, and asking for help. Well, the first thing you could do is buy this book. This is a book that's not just for black women. This is a book for, I, I tell black women, buy this book for your husband, buy this book for your son, buy this book for an, a, a person who is not African-American who wants to understand black women who wants to be an ally. Secondly, I was, I, you said, I would never 
think that I could come close to understanding the experience of black women. Why not? Why not? You have a heart, you have imagination, you have empathy. Certainly you can come very close to understanding what oppression and racism has done to black women in a theoretical sense and simply in a sense as a fellow traveler in this world that we live in. Um, to digress for a minute and I'll come back to your, your question. One of my pet peeves is that when we write and think about race and the history of segregation and racism in this country, it's always a discussion about how it has victimized Black people. Too often, there is so little written about what it has meant for white people to enslave Black people and in the process enslave themselves, to hate Black people and in the process hate themselves. Um, there was a brouhaha recently about a opera that was going to be show, uh, presented at John Jay a College in New York about Emmett Till, a collaboration between a white woman librettist and a black woman composer. And the libretto is written from the perspective of a white woman wrestling with being white and carrying the legacy of guilt and shame as someone complicit in racism and as someone complicit in the silence around Emmett Till's death. 12,000 people signed a online petition to censor and stop that play. But I feel that the story of Emmett Till is an American story. It doesn't just belong to me. And so I hunger for the story of white people who can recognize that the killing of Emmett Till kills something in them too. Okay, now I'm gonna get off the soapbox. Now I'm gonna answer your question about what you need to do. Listen, you need to simply make a space in your office or however you're communing with these young students and simply tell me your story. Tell me what you want to hear. And I have found as a journalist that people will tell me the most amazing things. I'm always astounded by how open people are, but they tell me this because I'm not judging them. I'm a simply a receptacle of their story. And if I use it, they know I'm going to use it in ways that will heal others. And I think that just listening, just saying to someone, tell me your story, let me hear your story. Secondly, I want to say that when I advise African Americans who are looking um, for mental health professionals, I say, you don't have to find a black therapist. I've been in therapy off and on about four different times for at various passages in my life when I needed mental health support. And only once did I have a black woman as a therapist. And so that while there are many, many ways on the internet, and many resources to find a quote, culturally specific, culturally comfortable person, I have enormous respect for those white therapists who listen, listen compassionately, listen humbly to their black patients, their black clients. So I think that you are much more empowered than you may know. Thank you for that. I see Stacy Ann Wink. Yes. Hi. I, it's more of a comment than a question. I was um, reading your book in the car with my son, and uh, he's six, and uh, he's starting to read. So he was like, "Oh, come sit with me and and let me see what you're reading." And I said, okay, all right. I went around to the back seat and he said, thank you for sitting with me. I said, oh, I didn't expect that. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. And then I started to read the titles of your other books. And before I got to it, he said, where's the book with the white women? How come they're not here? Like, I wanna know what they wanna say. I said, oh, look, she has a book, Skin Deep, just about that. 
<laughs> and he said, oh, okay, okay. Because everybody should talk about it. I said, oh, that's good. I'm glad you think that. So I just wanted to say, you know. Um, yeah, he's, he's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> He's brilliant. We should we should really listen to our young people. Yeah, that's great. So the next person I have is Tenny Adani, and please uh, correct me if I said your name wrong. Hi, thank you. That was close enough, Tenny Adani, and thank you for putting this together. It's uh, very informational. So my question is. Um, more from a parent angle who's raising a girl child and um, a strong black woman. Yes, the foundation may not have been what I wanted or how I wanted, but somehow it has molded me into what I am today. So without losing that touch, help wanting your daughter to be strong, to be able to, we're hoping that things get better on from here, but then you need to help them get ready or prepare them if things never really change, so to speak. So how do you then bridge that gap? Help them to still stay strong without necessarily the faulty foundation that we kind of had. Apologies to our parents, you know, it's not like um, they knew that they did the best that they could under the circumstances that were within their hands. So that's just an area that I'm hoping that you can touch base on. We don't lose the touch, help them remain strong, but then with a different kind of foundation. Well, well thank you for that. Um, this will allow me to segue into a conversation about grief and grieving because I'm gonna use a particular kind of example. Um, I know someone said to me, oh, Marita, when I read this book, before I read this book, I was proud to be a strong black woman. <laughs> When I finished it, I didn't know what to feel. And I said, well, you know, that's okay. Because the reason you don't know what to feel is because I'm asking you to create a new definition. And that's something that you're not going to do just by closing the book. It's something, it's a project that's going to be multi-generational. And so we're going to have to start talking to our daughters about new meanings of strength that it does that being strong doesn't mean that you don't ask for help uh being strong doesn't mean that you have to be strong for everybody being strong doesn't mean that you can never show emotion and even in white settings where we are often penalized and marginalized for showing any emotion that may be um, that may mark us as a strong black woman, a crazy black woman, an angry black woman, if we strategize and use the intelligence we have, we can still show anger in creative ways. I'm going to talk about two little examples of how we talk to our young daughters today. Um, one of the women in the book who I interviewed in, in one of the stories. Um, after I interviewed her, the book was being produced and I was just checking in to see how she was. She shared that during the lockdown, her partner, um, her, her male partner had died and it was deeply traumatic. Uh, in the early days of COVID, he got some symptoms. They went to the emergency room and in those days, which were very chaotic and a lot of not knowing what to do, he was basically told, you know, take aspirin and go home. Okay. So three days later, symptoms come back. He's in deep distress and they're driving to the hospital. And her daughter, who is not his daughter, but it's her daughter, um, is in the backseat. While they're driving to the hospital emergency room, he dies in the car. He just expires in the passenger seat. So after his death, she said that the first thing she did was she got into counseling, grief counseling, and she got her daughter into grief counseling with her. And she said it was very important for her to cry in front of her daughter. It was very important for her to let her daughter know how much pain she felt at the loss of this man. 
Then her daughter was able to cry and her, they were able to comfort each other. So that we see strength as fixing things. Strength is also revealing things. Strength is also bonding with another person in pain. And so she got an opportunity as they grieve together to become stronger mother and daughter. And she learned that this was a hard moment in her life, but she could survive it. She saw her, and, and in, for example, in my book, I talk about, um, I ask, yeah, I talk about, we never want our daughters or our children to see us cry. We always wanna be perfect. And I asked my son, who's now 40 something, if he ever remembered seeing me cry. And he said, yes, he did. And this was during a time when as a teenager, he'd made some decisions that um, could have had some disastrous ramifications. And as a family, we were trying to work through this and help him through this. And it was very disappointing, very difficult. We got through it, but I cried and I let him see me cry. And I said, well, what did you learn from seeing me cry? He said, well, I learned that you were a strong woman. You, I'd always looked up to you as my strong mother, but I learned that the decisions I made had ramifications, that the decisions I made could affect other people, that the decisions I made could hurt other people. And I realized that as strong as you were, you were not invincible. That's a lot to learn. And those are the kinds of things that our children need to learn. And they will put together their own definitions of strength that are combination of strength as well as vulnerability, which they can do in this new world that we live in. They're not living in our world. They're living in a new world. Thank you for that. I'm gonna go to Lana Scott. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ms. Golden, my question is about representation. I have a background in film. I've been studying film for over 10 years and I've mainly focused in gender studies, sexuality and black feminist theory in films. And I'm just curious, given the climate that we have now, given the black women that we are seeing on screen, on television, do you think that narrative of the strong black woman is changing? Because there's so many different kind of black female characters. I always go back to scandal because I always think of Kerry Washington and Viola Davis and how to get away with murder and just other black female characters that are considered strong because they're independent. They know how to do this. But thinking about the black women actresses in public. Do you think any of that, do you think they're helping or kind of hindering this, this well, kind I, of stereotype? Sure, I think that, and, and kudos to you. And I think that your generation of black women is doing some amazing things around representation. And I think that we are probably, while the, the old paradigms of super strength, strong black woman, the old paradigms of colorism persist. There is enormous change that is happening depending on where you look. Even when we look at a show like um, How to Get Away with Murder, the, the relationship between Anna, Annalise and her mother those set those shows where Cicely Tyson was brought on and they were talking about their backstory and their trauma were absolutely amazing representations of African American women traumatized in pain, working through trying to heal. The spontaneous moment when Viola Davis just took off the wig which was not scripted. That was not a thing she was supposed to do. Liberated women all over the world 
because she was saying, this is the this is who I have to be for the world. This is who I am. Um, I talk about this in the book. And when you look, for example, at the work of Ava DuVernay on um, Queen Sugar, one of the most interesting um, story arcs has been the, the, the relationship between the two sisters, the two half sisters. And they've talked about everything from colorism to you think you're the boss. And so if you look at streaming, if you look at cable, you will see some very exciting in interrogations of what it means to be a strong black woman. Typically in the conventional TV world, you know, ABC, CBS, you're going to get the same old stuff. But I'm enormously excited by what I'm seeing in the world of representation where you can actually do brave and adventurous things. So we're kind of in a, in a halfway point. But I think that there's, I know I, I, I was telling somebody one time, I said, oh my God, this is a great time to be a black woman. I can be black on, a black woman on any channel you turn to. And so I think that this is a great moment. I think that things are definitely changing. And as I say, depending on where you look, but things are changing and I expect you to be part of the change. Thank you. Saganesh. Thank you, Tracy. Um, it's not a question. I just wanted to make a comment uh, about the book, what I felt after I read this. Um, and when I read this book and the stories of the women, um, I saw myself in them. And uh, how, how to be strong. And as a person who raised her daughter as a single mother mm -hmm. in a new country, mm -hmm. uh, adapting, trying to adapt to everything and experiencing it in a new way, um, I couldn't let myself be weak. Mm -hmm. I just like so many of those women, um, I, I couldn't afford even to cry because crying was a luxury for me. You have to have someone to cry. So I needed to be strong for her. And I, I think I was strong for her because <laughs> she has turned out to be a strong young woman. Um, and your book, Miss Golden, like made me recognize the importance of therapy for the first time, really, because I saw it through the stories woven, uh, like among the women that you presented in the book. And uh, I would say that it has opened my eyes to look at it positively. So I just wanted to say thank you for writing uh, these stories and this book. Thank you. Thank you so that. much. Thank you so much. And you know, my, my son, um, who um, he's married to a superwoman, um, a, a, a young woman who is a scholar in um, her field, quite distinguished. And um, well, he married me. No. <laughs> <laughs> there as well. But she and I had a conversation with it. They have a daughter. I have a beautiful granddaughter named Mina. And we were talking and she was saying that it's very important for Amina to see my son caring for her. It's very important for Amina to know that her father will feed her, will change her diapers. Um, when, when, when she's upstairs in the office doing her work, he's downstairs caring for Amina. And then when he needs to go do his work, she cares for Amina. So they have a marriage and, and, the, and, and they have a marriage that's really equal. And she's very concerned about ensuring the mental health in that marriage. So I'm very proud of young women like her 40 and under who are really leading the way in changing our attitudes about what we mean by strength and that women don't have to do everything. 
So, but thank you, thank you for that. Dashka. Hi, thank you. Um, I was listening to you talk earlier about motherless daughters and a part of me, especially now that I'm in my thirties, I'm thinking back at my upbringing and having had to take care of myself emotionally. I've had a wonderful mother. I've, I, I can't say that I'm you know, upset about anything that's happened, but thinking back, I felt that she was very brutal in the way she brought my sister and I up. And at some point we had a little brother and she was so docile with him. And we're like, what, what happened here? Like, <laughs> you know, now he's coming out of the gates, he's starting his life and he's not as tough as the, his, her two girls. So I'm seeing that and I'm seeing a lot of other women who, black women who struggle with the toughness. So it seems like black women are tough on each other. And they're not so tough with their sons, not even just sons. Oh but yeah, with yeah, yeah. We 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 um, raise our daughters and spoil our sons. Right, right. And I I have yet to figure out why that is. I was wondering if through your work and research and experience, is there something that explains that in a way mm -hmm. that I could yeah. understand? Yeah, and, and I think even that is being interrogated and questioned and changed. But typically, what it the reason that was done is because in many families, it was felt that um, the, 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 the daughter on the one hand had to be prepared for a world that was really cruel because it's not just that she was black, she was a woman. And they didn't say it in those terms that she was gonna face sexism and racism, but that's what was activating it. So it was felt that girls had to had to be capable. Girls, black girls had to be competent. Black girls were going to be responsible for their families. They were they were going to be um, mothers and they were going to be breadwinners because because they weren't going to necessarily be able to uh, depend on their husband having the kind of job that would allow them just to be a homemaker. So that they black girls had to be raised to be able to do everything. And very often black families would send their daughters to college as an advantage to give them the advantage of that because men had, even though they were black men in America, they were still men. And they had a kind of um, mobility that black women did not have. And so black men had maleness and they would always have that woman to care for them while she cared, while she held the whole world on her shoulders. And I think that's a tradition um, that also is being interrogated, but there's certainly echoes of it, but it grows out, once again, that's related to racism, systemic racism. Carolyn. Thank you so very much for doing this. This is amazing. Um, my question goes to, supporting K-12 students, the younger black and brown females. Um, and in particular, because I am a math educator of, of teachers, so K-12 um, education, mm -hmm. who have to shoulder a lot of the responsibilities, particularly in math and STEM fields, um, to support our, our black and brown girls um, in, in, in that space. Any advice, any um, recommendation mm -hmm. as to- sure how to begin to, because it starts very young. We know that we start to build, you know, these faulty um, identities in these spaces at a very young age. So what are your suggestions, recommendations for black and brown female teachers um, in, in math spaces and supporting our younger girls? Well, there's a great site and organization started by Lauren Carson. And I talk about her in the book. It's called Black Girls Smile. And Lauren is a young woman who suffered with um, clinical depression, who twice tried to commit suicide and got into therapy and found out that she had a history of clinical depression in her family. So around the time that President Obama was creating the, the Black Boys Initiative, she felt there needed to be something for Black girls. And so she created an organization called Black Girls Smile and it's actually, you can just Google it. And they are now in about 26 different cities. 
And what they do is they partner with K-12 um, schools and they offer workshops and presentations and skill building to support young black and brown girls around the issue of mental health because they know that these girls at 10 years old, at 11 years old, need to develop the vocabulary to describe what they are feeling. Many of these young girls live in communities that are impoverished, communities that are plagued with violence. They live in homes plagued with trauma and they are depressed and they need to learn how to say they are depressed, how to ask for help when they are in distress. And so she, her organization would be a great um, resource to look into, to see what they're doing. They will um, work with young girls who are 10, 11, 12 around journaling, for example. Just, just having a diary to, to journal and pour your feelings in. Um, they talk with them about um, communication with parents, you know, how to talk to your parents about what you're feeling. So um, I would suggest visiting her website um, there's also a lot on the internet about this whole issue of mental health and Black females. So that would also be valuable. But I think that making, just, just using a new vocabulary um, that says that you have a right, if you're sad, you're sad. I'll give you an example. When you talk about it starts early to go back to grief and loss, one of my husband's um, nieces um, lost her husband and he was the stepfather of her two daughters. And so one day I had the two daughters in the car, I was taking them to the movies and I was, you know, trying to comfort them and saying, I know that this is a difficult time for you and that you have probably cried a lot. And the 10 year old said to me, Aunt Marita, I haven't cried. I've held it in. So at 10 years old, she's already a strong black woman. And so what that informed me is that I need to model, I need to have conversations with her about the fact that she can cry, that she doesn't need to hold it in. I need to have conversations with her about how I have cried and how I have felt like I would never get over things, but that I did. And I think that we, one of the things we do, we often think that young children can't understand, oh my gosh, they understand so much. They're so smart and they're so intuitive. And I always talk to the young people in our family. I talk to them like adults and they appreciate that and they learn from that. So I think that um, we have to start having those kinds of conversations and not being, not fearing that they will not be able to understand You. I have a question from the audience. So person says, I am reflecting on the complex ties between family and responsibility, particularly between parents and children. What is a helpful way to rethink being a strong black woman for one's family, particularly with ailing parents who believe that we should hold things in and are supposed to sacrificially support one another? Well, I think that if you're really feeling this very deeply, you may seek professional counseling. And I think you, you need to start learning how to set boundaries because just from the question, it sounds like you may feel emotionally overwhelmed by the responsibilities that you're carrying. And learning to say no is just that, learning to say no. I mean, I'm one of those people, I always, I have the no gene. I never had a problem saying no. Now I had other problems, but I never had a problem saying no. Um, but it is a journey and it's a journey because it fills us with guilt. I mean, as women, not even just as black women, but just as women, we are hardwired biologically to feel that we have to be caretakers, that we have to be compassionate, that we have to be fixers. And so what we're talking about in learning to set boundaries is essentially rewiring the brain and the brain can be rewired. It's rewired all the time. But I think that, as I said earlier, the rec you have to recognize that you have a right 
to not feel overwhelmed. You have a right um, to say no. And you can say no. You can say no to ailing parents. You're not going to say it like that. But you, you can help ailing parents understand your need to set boundaries, even in situations where you may be the anchor. Because I know a lot of situations in families are where there's one child who has the responsibility for everything. But you may not be able to get support from siblings, but they're your friends who can give you advice about this. So I think that's the main thing is hooking into your feelings. What are you really, really feeling? Are you really, really angry? Are you really, really resentful? That's telling you something. And that's telling you that you need some support around dealing with that as you set boundaries. Thank you for that. And I have time for one more question and that's Antoinette. I really don't have a question. I'm just basically telling you that how thankful I am for your book, because um, as I read through a lot of the comments and the sections, it really made me realize that there was a lot of things that our family just, we just covered up and everybody held it in. Nobody had these discussions. And then like you continue to do the same thing with your children. <laughs> and so it just keeps happening over and over again. And no one really has discussions about anything that happens. And when you do try to talk about it, I found that they were like, what's wrong with you? What are you crying for? Don't let people see you cry. And then, you know, like everybody just holds everything in. So I felt like reading this book was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly our family. <laughs> like thinking to yourself, we're, we're all members of the same family. <laughs> So you're like, wow, this is so powerful. And it's true. Like we're taught that you don't really talk about mental health. And if somebody has a breakdown, you don't tell anyone, you just keep it to yourself and you don't really know how to deal with it. So when you see a lot of these things that happen like death and people, your senior people being old, you really just hold things in. And then one day you just explode and you're like wondering, why am I crying like this? You know? And there's no one to talk to because everyone you go to, they're all like, be quiet. Don't tell anyone that you feel like this. You know, you'll probably be fired or something, you know? So you just find like, wow, when you read this, you're like, wow, this is real. <laughs> you know, we need this. Like we need spaces where we actually have these conversations. So I just wanted to take this moment before you left to just say, thank you for doing this book. It is so good. And we do need to pass the, this book around so that other people are actually reading it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was just, I just, as I was listening to you, I just looked down at the chat and someone talked about, someone posted something about immigrant families. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because I'm working with a, a, a woman, um, really fine writer who is a therapist who came to this country from J Jamaica after having been separated from her mother and father for six years. And she's writing in her book about the emotional burden, the, the emotional um, trauma that is experienced by young children who are separated from their families um, for many years as the families come to America to create the American dream. And then the children come to America and feel enormous isolation and um, pain because they were not mothered, they were not fathered. And there's a whole, um, that's a whole other part of the immigration journey that is deeply, deeply impactful on the lives of, of immigrants in this country. And so that's, these parents were strong. Okay, they did everything right. They, they sacrificed, but they still have to acknowledge the sacrifices that their children endured. And here in Washington, DC, where I live, um, we have a, a, a very good center that deals with um, immigrants from all over the world. They can go to this multicultural um, psych psychological support space and get therapy in their language. And many of them are dealing with issues um, with their children, anger, resentment, but these are things that can be overcome. They can be healed. Thank you for that. And I'm going to allow Andrea Kelton Harris I'm from Harvard to close us out. Well, again, thank you, uh, Ms. Golden, for this wonderful book. 
for this powerful presentation and for this affirmation of so many things that as black women we felt um, and other women may have experienced and other men as well. Um, and giving us a tool that we can use to say, uh, this is what's happening to me and it's okay to say no. It's mm -hmm. okay to set boundaries. It's okay to seek help. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you're not strong by exactly. doing that. Exactly. So thank you so thank much you. for this. Thank um, you. On behalf of uh, Pamela Mason, who was our faculty co-chair of the Association of Black Faculty and <laughs> Fellows at Harvard, um, myself and Shirley Green as the executive committee, I want to thank again Tracy Jones for making this partnership between our organizations happen. Um, it, you know, we're so close to each other, but yet so far. And as we think about sister circles, um, it would be amazing to talk more about how we can develop these, even across our institutional lives, um, to help each other grow. Thank you so much to the Harvard staff um, and others who came uh, to support this event as well. And this is not hopefully the last time that we will come together. Thank you to all of the organizations at MIT that joined together um, and helped us to be able to partner and cross that bridge um, that exists sometimes and come together as people of color and people who are interested in having a better way for all of us. So again, I just, I just have a lot of thank yous um, and I can't wait to finish this book. I am going to get this book for everyone I know, all the members <laughs> I know are getting it for Mother's Day. <laughs> and it's something we really should share broadly. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone for coming and the event will be recorded, was recorded. Um, and we will let the respective schools know how to get um, a copy of the recording. So have a wonderful day, everyone. So glad you were able Thank to. Thank you. Come out. Yes. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Barbara, go ahead. <laughs> that was amazing. Barbara, you're on mute. I'm leaving. I... Thanks everybody for coming and, and Marita, thanks for uh, excellent discussion, a book that provoked that discussion. And if you're interested in partnering with our ERG, please get in touch with our co-leads, Natalie or Virginia, and everybody have a great day.